So I reminded you here the uh, last slide uh, from the uh, first lecture where we uh, uh, defined the amplification of a one factor by a positive uh, real numbers. Um, so uh, first one does that for uh, uh, integers for the for the the case uh, say uh, this amplifying number is t uh, so for t is equal to n this is just the algebra of n by n matrices over m okay uh, so also the can view, be viewed as the tensor product of n by n matrices over the scalars with M, with the obvious uh, trace state. OK, you check immediately that this is also a two factor with one of the many definitions, uh, ways to characterize them that we, we learned about. Uh, OK, on the other hand, if the amplifying number T is less than 1, uh, then you take a, a projection P in M that has trace equals to T, and this uh, corner given by P of, of M, so this algebra of PMP, will be a two one factor with this normalized trace. Its uh, isomorphism class obviously only depends on, on T and uh, not on the choice of the projections because of the equivalence in, in M. And then for any, uh, uh, for an arbitrary t, uh, so it's what's left is, you know, larger than 1 and, and non-integer, then you just take a sufficiently large n by n matrix algebra over m, and then you cut with an appropriate projection so that you have this, the trace of this projection in, in here. So it's always tau, remember, is the normalized trace. They, you, which is unique, so that's why we kind of generically denote it by tau. Uh, so with, with the, the, the trace of that projection equals t over n, uh, then, uh, you know, that, that's the algebra I'm taking. Uh, uh, then, then uh, uh, you know, this uh, corner of the n by n matrix is given by this p. Uh, you know, it's... it's um, the isomorphism class of that is what we denote by n to the t. So this doesn't depend on the choices of the n. You can take a much larger n, uh, and, but then you know the projection you take has to satisfy that. So the intuition is this. You remember the two one factors. We look at them as uh, being. Uh, I always drew this picture for a two one factor because of the analogy with the uh, uh, n by n matrices, except that where, where you, you know, matrices, you draw them like that, and here you have the entries, right? Uh, well, here, this, uh, you know, instead of having indices from 1 to n for n by n matrices, here it's from 0 to 1, right? Uh, for obvious reasons, and, you know, you, it's here you drew various pictures that, you know, uh, give you the, the intuition for, so it's like 0, 1 to 0, 1 kind of matrix algebra, and especially the hyperfinite one factor very clearly points towards this intuition, okay? So the, the thing is, if you take, when we take n by n matrices for this particular purpose, so say you take two by two matrices over M, then you view your two one factor as this, you know, uh, top entry, uh, upper left entry, and this is two by two matrices over this, and three by three matrices will be like that, and so on, okay? And so uh, I'm, in other words, including n by n matrices into n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrices, uh, unlike we did before, we now put like 0 elsewhere in this kind of, uh, you know, increasing uh, sequence. Uh, that, that's how you, uh, you know, you view this. And then when you take those projections, 
uh, you know, to, to satisfy that formula, tau of p is equal to t over n, you see immediately why it doesn't depend on n nor on, on uh, uh, the, 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 you know, on, on the choices you make for the projections, okay? So uh, think a little bit about, you know, this picture and this uh, kind of intuition, okay? I should have drawn smaller pictures so that I have uh, enough room. Okay, so we obviously have this uh, uh, amplification uh, is, uh, uh, satisfies this, you know, consecutive uh, uh, amplifications give you uh, this, uh, you know, the m to the s to the t is mst. So the word amplification makes you use this notation with the t up, right? And that's the initial original notation of Marin von Neumann. However, you know, since then there are like two versions. That there is also a justification for denoting it like this, obviously. as t by t matrix is sort of right over m. And then, uh, you know, people, because of that, use this notation. Uh, OK? So there are like two schools for that. Uh, but the original notation and the very word, you know, amplification, I mean, you tend like putting it up when you amplify things. OK? Incidentally, I mean, rather than that, I would use this notation, which is very suggestive also. Very clear, I mean, very good notation would that be also. And which, by the way, it is a quite remarkable thing that you, one can take because of two one, these objects allow taking t by t matrices, you know, for arbitrary real positive number, which is amazing. And we defined uh, this fundamental group. We won't uh, care about it, you know, for a while. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, obviously a beautiful invariant, right? So uh, uh, is it true that all these amplifications are isomorphic to n? You know, what happens with this multiplicative group? Uh, anyway, so uh, let's also look, and I drew this picture, especially because obviously, you know, as n grows, you have these inclusions of algebras one into the other, and you, you feel like, you know, drawing this kind of half lines and having like a, you know, wh why not an infinite amplification of a two one factor? So what's that kind of algebra? So let's talk just a little bit about that. Uh, so uh, first of all, I make uh, this, uh, you know, observation about tensoring T taking tensor products of von Neumann algebras. So if, if you take von Neumann algebras, arbitrary for the moment, uh, then uh, you can define that von Neumann tensor product, uh, which just acts on the tensor B of H1, tensor B of H2, which is like B of H1, tensor H2, you can I write, uh, as being you know, the weak operator the closure of the algebraic tensor product, right? Just, you know, okay, in, in here. So that's, as it happens, it doesn't depend on the initial representations of the MIs as von Neumann algebra. So this has a, you know, a clear, it's, it's uniquely defined. It makes sense to use this notation for the so-called von Neumann tensor product of M1 and M2. And now if you take a partial von Neumann algebra, so finite von Neumann algebra, uh, then let's take this, the tensor product of, of M uh, with the, the B of H for some H, you know, let's take it specifically L2 of some set S of some cardinality. Uh, so I'm taking M2, M1 is my M, and M2 is B of H itself. And so this will act here. And th this, as, as you see immediately, taking finite rank projections here in B of H with the one here, one tensor dose, will give you some projections that are uh, finite 
uh, when you cut in the sense that if you cut m by these pi's, okay, you, you get finite von Neumann algebras, right? Because it's like, you know, taking n by n matrices, uh, if pi is, is of rank n, it's like taking n by n matrices over the initial n. Okay, which we, you know, we saw from previous page. I mean, this is finite. I'm not taking it at one factor for now. But obviously, you know, it, you still get a, a for Neumann algebra with a faithful trace, uh, so normal, etc. And so it's, it's, it will be, you know, finite trashial. Uh, okay, so such for Neumann algebras which are obtained, can, which have this exhaustion of one by finite projections, uh, uh, are, are called um, semi-finite, okay? Uh, they, uh, they are characterized in this way, okay, by this property, or alternatively by the fact that they have what's called a faithful normal semi-finite trace. Uh, so that is simply the tensor product of the trace on M with the trace on, on B of H. So this is no longer everywhere defined. It's defined like the trace on B of H, okay, uh, only on finite rank, finite, uh, uh, you know, say I restrict it to projections there, you know, it will be a function even, you know, from the projections to zero infinity, including infinity. So it, you can, you know, define it everywhere except that it will be equal to infinity for certain projections, for instance, for one. Uh, uh, but what's interesting is that it's semi-finite in the sense that it has sufficiently <coughs> many uh, um, projections and, and elements, positive elements, on which it is finite. That's the meaning of semi-finite. And normality is, again, you know, complete additivity for, of course, when it, you know, for projections and allowing infinity. So you have, you do have the, this trace on the sum of projections, the sum goes out, but like the measure on the real line, you may have, you know, sets of measure infinity, okay? But it's still completely additive. Okay, so uh, uh, these are semi-finite von Neumann algebras, and if you take M to be a 2-1 factor, okay, and, and this set infinite, uh, by the way, of course, finite von Neumann algebras are semi-finite, right? It's just, right, so it's, uh, I mean, it, they may have a finite trace, but this is, so this is a larger class. However, uh, you know, to, uh, so this is quite specific. These are not finite, <laughs> I mean, possibly, uh, you know, so, okay, let me start that again. So, and, and from this line on. So if I'm taking M to be a 2-1 factor and in this construction and the set S to be infinite, then this tensor product is what one calls a 2-infinity factor. It's a, like an infinite amplification of M, namely you know, an S amplification of M, or rather the cardinality of S amplification of M, okay, for obvious reasons. And if you want, this picture suggested this construction by just taking, you know, n growing. Uh, this is uh, the case where s is countable, right? So l, l, uh, when, when uh, here uh, the, the, my set s is just the natural numbers, and that's the way you should view these two infinity factors as, you know, a limiting process of this, okay? This, so very much in analogy with the way you get B of L2 of the natural numbers from the finite, from n by matrices, but which you put in, you know, corners with completed with zero and growing like that, right? So that's the two infinity factor. And there is an important example of semi-finite von Neumann algebras, which I want to quickly construct here. Uh, the so-called, some very important construction. We'll work with this a lot uh, in the next, uh, you know, today, uh, or rather more like, you know, in the uh, next lectures, uh, but also today. So the so-called basic construction. So uh, uh, these semi-finite von Neumann algebras are associated with inclusions of 
of uh, 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 finite for normal uh, algebra. So here, m is the two one factor from the previous line, and b, or more generally, a threshold for Neumann algebra. B is a von Neumann subalgebra, so it's a weakly closed star subalgebra with the same identity as M. And EB, you remember, was the orthogonal projection. You remember you, we had this, uh, actually we did not prove this, uh, but it's very easy to show that when you squeeze elements uh, of, of M, now, uh, okay, make a parenthesis here. M we kind of identified with lambda of m, which is the left multiplication by m, always, okay? So that's how we view it in B of L2 of m. And in B of L2 of m, so when m is viewed as lambda of m, if I squeeze uh, an x in here by this projection EB, you get the, the, uh, the, the, uh, you get the expectation of, uh, of x onto b. You remember that formula. Uh, this is very easy to check, so I leave that as an exercise. Uh, incidentally, this is the, 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 the existence, this projection, and with this formula, were first found by, by Takesaki, by Masamichi, in a, one of his very early papers about conditional expectations. Uh, and uh, so one denotes this uh, uh, algebra generated by M and, and EB in this way. Uh, and uh, now uh, this Poneman uh, algebra uh, in B of L2, uh, you can de describe it in, so first of all, it's a phonemic algebra generate. So it's like adding this new element to M. And I claim that, first of all, that it's the weak operator closure of, of this uh, star uh, uh, subalgebra, the span of all elements of this form X, E, B, Y, okay, with x and y in m. So I claim that rather than having to take products, since it's an algebra, and, you know, you, you should normally take products. Etc. <laughs> okay. But you see, because of that product formula, uh, every time you, you have a y in between, this is EB uh, of y times EB. And by the way, that, that also implies that this, uh, this, these elements are in, in um, I forgot to mention that, but this EB commutes with N, another property that, of course, it's implied by this. I mean, you can deduce it from this, but it's very easy. I should have included that. So EB satisfies this property. Elements in here commute with it. And so, you know, you, you have this squeezing formula. You have EB with the x and uh, what was it, z here. So this is another element in M with EB, Z, so you, uh, you know, from a, a product like this, you again get uh, something that's, uh, you know, just of this form, um, or just uh, this kind of monomials, uh, where is it here, okay? Uh, so, uh, this is obviously, a, so because of that, this will be a star algebra, uh, and this weak operator closure is just a, this von Neumann algebra uh, generated by M and DB. And it's also equal to taking the commutant of the right multiplication operators by B of this von Neumann algebra that acts on, on L2, uh, you know, from, by multiplication with elements in, in, in B from the right side. So, okay, so it's a commutant of this, uh, okay? Uh, so now this von Neumann algebra has a normal semi-finite faithful trace uniquely determined by this formula. So it is a semi-finite von Neumann algebra, okay? So that's 
you know, an important example of semi-finite von Neumann algebra. And, and by the way, the, so this is what one calls the basic construction for B into M. So this new bigger algebra, this the basic construction algebra with its trace. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, with this uh, in mind, uh, let me uh, you know clarify as as promised. You remember last time we said well uh, we have this uh, 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 representation of M onto L2 of M, which is given by the trace, by that representation, by left multiplication operators, as by lambda, okay? Uh, but um, we did not clarify what are all the possible von Neumann representations of uh, a 2 one factor, more generally of a threshold von Neumann algebra. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, so, it, by the way, uh, a, a von Neumann representation means for us that the, the range, so let's call it pi, the range uh, is VO closed, okay? So it's a representation, a faithful of course, representation of M as a C-star algebra, isometric representation, but uh, in addition with the range being VO closed, or equivalently SO closed. So is a von Neumann algebra direct? Is still a von Neumann algebra, so it's okay? Uh, that's uh, uh, okay. So the first observation I made here is that that happens first of all if and only if pi is completely additive or, or what we call uh, normal. Uh, uh, and uh, so we also call such represent. I mean, of course, the corresponding Hilbert space you can view it as as a Hilbert M module. So they. As usual, like in representation, group representation theory, you can, where you can view group representations as modules, uh, so Hilbert modules of, of that group. So here, the same way you can view the Hilbert space on which you represent as, as an M module. And the, 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 this formulation, a Hilbert M module, means that the that representation is normal, okay? So, and you, one says that two such representations or two such M modules are uh, uh, equivalent if the, there exists, of course, a unitary between the Hilbert spaces that intertwines the, the reps, or if you prefer, the, the module, left module structures. For now, we only look at left modules. When I say module, it's a left module. Uh, Okay, so uh, the other observation is that, so I'm constructing from one such von Neumann representation two types of reps. Uh, so if M is a von Neumann algebra, so a von Neumann rep, if you want, of M, and, and you take a projection in the commutant of M, then this map, okay, taking x into x times p prime in, in the b of p prime of h is ob obviously, you know, normal, right? A and so it's a phonema representation of m. I'm not talking about here about faithfulness because if m is not a factor, this might not be, be faithful. Uh, let's leave that. But in any case, it's a phonema rep of m. So it's isometric. I'm sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's normal, so it's completely additive, okay? Uh, right, if, and if M is a, is a factor, this will uh, obviously, I mean, it's an easy exercise to, to see that, you know, because of the, fate, the, because of the fact that it's a phonema representation, will automatically be also faithful. So, uh, if, uh, and the other, uh, observation is that if you have a family of reps, you can take the direct sum of, of them. Well, basically, any phonema representation, this is a general fact, okay, which will, will you know, refine for two one factors, but it's, it's a general fact that uh, if you have a faithful phonema representation of M, then any other phonema representation of M can be obtained through these, uh, you know, two uh, types of operations, okay? 
Uh, okay, let's be more specific if, uh, for Trashel, for Neumann algebras, more specifically to one factors. Uh, so uh, for, for such a, a for Neumann algebra, first of all, uh, the, I wanted to point out that uh, a representation, a star representation of it as a C star algebra will be continuous, will be a von Neumann representation. You remember we made this observation. If and only if pi is continuous from the unit ball of M with the norm 2 topology to B of H with the SO topology. Actually, I didn't do it specifically this way, this, but it's in the spirit of, you remember that, uh, you know, uh, abstract characterization of Trashel von Neumann algebra, or finite von Neumann algebras, okay? So uh, we keep in mind that that's what, so in other words, the normality or complete additivity, you can, you know, check that by, I mean, that's equivalent to discontinuity in norm 2 on the on bounded sets on the unit ball of m and uh, so here is the classification of the hilbert modules for a two one factor so this is what i said very specific you know description and in fact classification of all uh, uh, left modules over a two one factor uh, well first observations is that any cyclic Hilbert M module is of this form, L2 of MP, where you hit M from the right with a projection. Okay, so this is rho of P. So it's, this is self-explanatory, this notation, L2 of MP. But it's a, by definition, is rho of P applied to L2 of M. Okay, so of course this will be a left M module. Okay. So any uh, cyclic means, of course, that, you know, m psi is equal to h. Okay, so that's what it means to be cyclic. You have a vector that, uh, and, um, so this is very easy to prove. It's an exercise, um, and uh, then uh, by a maximality or argument, you get that any Hilbert M module will be therefore of the of this form because you know you can exhaust it with cyclic cyclic modules, right? Uh, for some family of projections. So now I think you can guess what we are heading to. Uh, because uh, obviously if you take uh, other fam another family of PIs, uh, say QIs, with the PI equivalent to QI in M, okay, that will give you an equivalent M module. In fact, you have more than that, you have the following. So if, uh, if you have another Hilbert M module, which is, which you write in this manner, so given by some projections QJ over another set of indices, capital J, this is capital A, capital J here, then these two modules will be equivalent if and only if you have this, the sum of the traces on, for this one is equal to the sum of the traces on the right side. This, of course, formula is viewed um, as in like cardinals. So you, if the, the sums are finite, okay, then it's obvious what it means. The moment it's infinite, you can assume that an infinite integer in the sense that it's exactly, you know, without uh, some remaining things. So they add up, you know, one plus one plus one, etc. Of course, these QJs, you can split them and add them in a different way and so that we have only integers and, and some remaining. And when you have the infinite situation, you can get rid of the you know, remaining and just have L2 of M, L2 of M, etc. that many times you know, for a certain cardinal. Okay, so the, this means equality of those cardinals. Uh, and one denotes by the dim of of the dimension of the Hilbert M module H to be this sum, which of course does depend by this observation. That's 
the, the dimension of H over M or dimension of the M module H uh, and uh, okay this observation says that this M Hilbert M modules are completely classi classified by their di dimension which in addition takes all the values here okay so this is it these are all the reps of and uh, I, let's look at them differently, it's useful. Uh, let me point out that you, know, you have an obvious relation with the amplification thing. Uh, so if you take a, a T larger than, than one, I mean, and take a, a Hilbert module of dimension T, um, okay? And uh, so uh, then if you take a uh, projection here of trace 1 over t and cut on the left, okay, uh, then uh, this, uh, you see, it's like, think of t as an integer for this purpose, to have a clear intuition. So this is n by n matrices, and what I'm saying when you cut by p is like taking the first row, okay, so it's 1, 0, 0, it's the projection p of trace 1 over n, t is n, I'm taking a projection of trace 1 over n, and so you take the first row, okay, and that's your uh, n uh, uh, dimensional uh, Hilbert module, okay? So, uh, okay, so uh, you can obtain all this picture of all um, finite, at least finite dimensional modules by cutting appropriately the amplifications of m. Uh, in this manner, okay, on the, on the left. So, um, okay, uh, and the other observation, the so-called coupling uh, uh, constant theorem of Marin von Neumann says that, so, if the, the dimension is finite, then, uh, I, I should have said this more clearly here, or, yes, it is actually sufficiently clear. Uh, then m prime, so if the dimension is finite, then m prime is also a 2 1 factor. It's actually obviously, especially because of this picture, obviously isomorphic to the amplification of m by t op, opposite. You remember the algebras on the right, if you relate them with m, you know, you have, it's like right representation of m, so therefore the, you know, the the product comes inter, I mean, inverted, so, you know, if you want them to be left, like usual representations, you have to take the opposite of that algebra. Uh, okay, so the commutant of M, when the dimension is finite, is a, a, a finite form, it's a two-one factor as well, actually, you know, it's, uh, is in a naturally identified with the T, with the, uh, yes, with the T amplification of uh, M opposite, okay? So this H will be a right M to the T module, okay? Okay. Uh, well, I have uh, written here, I don't would not like to spend too much time on this. Um, uh, it's two more classes of examples because of uh, we need this in order to give su su sufficient sort of, uh, you know, em emphasis and, I don't know, importance, oomph, I guess, you know, to the theorem we'll do next, which is the uniqueness of the amenable to one factor and the fact that all amenable to one factors are isomorphic to the hyperfinite to one factor. So at this point, we need to, uh, you know, considerably enlarge our, you know, examples, the family of examples of two one factors. So this is one remarkable class that coming from groups. So if, if I take discrete, a discrete group and its complex algebra, Okay, which, by the way, I like to view the complex algebra in this way. You know, it's just as a formal sums like this. These are what I call 
indeterminates UG, so it's just a copy of the group gamma, but I am the elements I, I write them as, as U sub G, right? It's like you know you, you for the integers it's like writing x to the n. Okay? If the group will be the integers, this U the U N is x to the n and this becomes the algebra of uh, polynomials or Laurent polynomials. And uh, so that's why I call them indeterminates. These are complex coefficients, C sub G. And, uh, okay, and I take the left regular representation of this algebra, just the extension, natural extension by, you know, uh, additive extension of the left regular representation uh, on L2 of gamma. This is by left multiplication, so, uh, okay, uh, just extending that. Uh, so if you want even L2 of gamma, you view them as L2 summable such formal sums uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the product operation for sure has uh, sense, you know, it's a convolutional operation and makes sense for finite, finite such sums in C gamma, okay? And then I take the weak operator closure, and this is a von Neumann algebra that I denote by L of gamma. Or this is a notation that is dear to Taka, who introduced it. I think it's very nice because it's minimalistic like this, L gamma. And it's called the group von Neumann algebra of gamma. It's a, 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 another of the constructions of Mara and von Neumann from the uh, Rings of operators four, I think that's in uh, 1943. Okay, so this is you see the UGR. This uh, actually I I write them. I also identify them with the you know the image of lambda of G of, of G by lambda and call them the canonical unitaries. So really here on the Hilbert space they will be unitary elements. Okay. And uh, you see here, I emphasize that you view this as the algebra of formal sums like this. And as it happens, this is a little theorem here that I'm hiding. So you, you take uh, the operators that you obtain here by weak operator closure, the operators in L of gamma are really like, you know, I can be naturally identified with infinite, possibly infinite formal sums like this. L2 summable, and they they will be in L of gamma if and only if uh, this uh, product, uh, which is the convolution product, belongs to L2 for any psi in L2, okay? And you have a normal faithful trace on this algebra, which just takes the, uh, the, the coefficient of the neutral element. So E here is the neutral element of the group gamma. Uh, and the, this is psi g is the orthonormal basis of L2, and so this is of course nothing but the the uh, the, the the vector state implemented by psi e. You see that immediately, of course. Yeah. So it it is a threshold for Neumann algebra. Well, you can prove very easily that. It's really an exercise that this is a two-one factor if and only if gamma is infinite conjugacy class. This is obvious because you see when you have these elements, okay, if such an element commutes with all the UHs, so by the way, uh, the star operation clearly corresponds to this, so CHUH, Star is CH bar UH minus 1. Okay? So that's the star operation corresponds to, to this involved, uh, uh, to, to this, um, I mean, the adjoint operation in B of H corresponds to this in the group <coughs> algebra. So when you take this, this is equal, will be equal to sum of CG U. Uh, H, G, H minus 1, and then you make a change of variables. This is sum of C, H minus 1, G, H, U, G, 
And if this is true for all H's, and one of the C's is non-zero, you get that they must be equal. Okay, so you have that uh, uh, conjugacy class of that non-zero element. You know, you have infinitely many uh, uh, coefficients that are non-zero and equal. So, but that contradicts the L2 summability. All the such formal sums, you remember, they, they will be uh, L2 summable, any formal sum in, in L of gamma. Okay, so uh, we, we have that this uh, uh, is a huge class of examples because you have examples of ICC groups uh, will be, you know, quite a few. Let me very quickly examples. So you have the the group, for instance, of uh, uh, finite permutations of the natural numbers. The, for instance, the free group, uh, the free groups in general. Okay, you also have. Um, let's see, there is the so-called um, uh, the so-called Reed product construction, which I hope you know. You, you know, so if you take a group that's non-trivial and gamma infinite, then this read product, uh, which is uh, is just uh, h to the power gamma, uh, which you take then uh, you know cross product as a group cr cross product with gamma with the action on on. Um, on uh, on h by by shifting the the coordinates okay <coughs> so uh, this group is also icc the read product is always gives you icc groups in when the you know the acting one is gamma is infinite so um, we have lots of examples okay uh, so there is uh, also a Remarkable construction that comes from uh, dynamical systems and you know non-commutative dynamic. Well, from groups acting on uh, probability measure spaces, uh, measure preservingly. Uh, so uh, like this. So uh, if I so I abbreviate probability. So when I write PMP, that means already that this X is a probability measure space. And the action is measure preserving. Okay, so uh, let's take such an action. Then one associates with the group measure, so-called group measure space for Neumann algebra. It's a cross product construction. Okay, uh, it's an L infinity cross product with gamma. Whenever you have an action on a space, it will act on the function algebra L infinity of x in the usual way. Okay. So uh, I won't write that down uh, because I hope all of you know that. So and once you have a, a group acting on an algebra, you have the cross product <coughs> construction from algebra, okay? And that here acts obviously on you know L two of x uh, tensor product with L two gamma, uh, okay? And you take you take it there and the, you take the weak operator closure, okay? Uh, by the way, like before, I like to view this algebra like this. So it's the algebra of formal sums. Uh, again, you know, like this, but where now the coefficients are in L infinity of x, so they are in the algebra on which gamma acts. And so just take formal sums like this. Uh, the, even this space, I like to think of it as the space of square summable sums like this. So this is, OK, uh, uh, Xi G, I forgot to say Xi G are in L2. OK, so it's the all formal sums like this. Uh, so in other words, 
what I'm doing here is taking L2 of x, direct sum, okay, with copies over g, okay, in other words. But these copies, I view them like this, you know, so it's, I just multiply this by this indeterminate, okay? This is, all, all this into, is good for a certain kind of intuition that pushes you to think of this as Fourier expansions here for the group algebra case, group von Neumann algebra case, okay? And, and here, um, you know, as this more, um, you know, Fourier-like, also Fourier-like uh, series, but with the coefficients in L2 for the Hilbert space on which it, I act, and, you know, with the algebra acting on it with the coefficients in L infinity like that, and the product, more generally, AG times UG uh, times, say, uh, Psi H UH, is the, you know, you, the, the idea is that you pass, uh, uh, you, you pass a coefficient from the right side to the left side by switching with sigma. So it's AG sigma G of Psi H UGH, okay? So, so that gives you both a, a Hilbert, uh, left Hilbert module of this Hilbert space over the, this algebra, uh, okay? And also an algebra structure on, on this, uh, you know, formal uh, series, okay? So that's how you should think of this space and also of the action of this algebra first the algebraic cross product which is just the finite sums like that okay and uh, okay okay so uh, this will be a two one factor uh, this is just it's not necessarily su it's sufficient it's sufficient condition for this to be a two one factor is that the action be free and ergodic of course, uh, I'm taking gamma infinite and x to be a non-atomic probability measure space here. However, you know, notice that another case is when x is the one point probability space and gamma is ICC in which I get this example. And that's also a two one factor. So in fact, uh, you know, another sufficient condition is that gamma is ICC and, and the action is ergodic without being free. I, I hope you know what freeness means and ergodicity for an action. These are well-known, uh, you know, uh, notions in, in dynamics, right? So I won't uh, remind them because we lose too much time. Uh, okay, so, and in this case, when you have free ergodic uh, L infinity, which, of course, sits in here because it's uh, it, you identified with u sub e is one equal to one it's the, the identity in this algebra okay uh, so i identify ag times one with ag i mean the, so l infinity sits naturally as a subalgebra in, in here in this cross product algebra and it's actually maximal abelian when you have already when you have freeness Ergodicity is you if, because you want the resulting algebra to be a two-one factor, and the normalizer uh, in in it. You remember the normalizer are the unitaries that that in the algebra M that normalize you know the abelian algebra A. Uh, I will define it in a more general case, uh, generating uh, this algebra. Uh, and that's also called uh, so a maximal abelian algebra whose normalizer generates the ambient one factor is called the Cartan subalgebra because it's like a, you know, by analogy with the uh, Lie algebra theory, it's like a, you know, a spine, uh, like a sort of diagonal of the of your two one factor, like you remember. So a typical example is our diagonal D in the hyperfinite two one factor. That was another uh, example of a Cartan subalgebra. Actually, I may have not defined this. I will get back to this. Anyway, this is an intrinsic definition, so 
uh, I mean, just an observation first that you have this, and that's something we will call a Cartan cell. I will give a formal definition of that a bit later. So there are more operations that uh, that one has, and I'll get back to that at, at that time. So first of all, the tensor product, we basically already discussed that. My only observation is that even if you take a, a finite or infinite tensor product, it's obviously what we mean when we take a, an infinite. It's just, uh, you know, algebra in, in B of infinite tensor product of the corresponding Hilbert spaces. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, so um, it is a two-one factor if all of them, the MI are, are uh, um, you know, um, so you have this uh, condition. So if uh, this tensor product, if you have all the MI are finite factors, so by that I mean they can be either matrix algebra, matrix factors or two-one factors. So and this is the condition to give you a two-one factor at the end. So either you can take infinite tensor product of matrices, right, like we did for the hyperfinite one, then you do get a two-one factor. But another, of course, when you take, when one of them is a two-one factor, for sure the <coughs> resulting thing will be a two-one factor. Okay? Anyway, you can also take just infinite tensor product of two-one factors. It's an interesting operation. There is an operation of free product. We'll get back to that. Um, also amalgamated free product over a subalgebra where you have a natural trace. So first you take the, you know, for the algebraic free uh, product and then you have on it uh, a, a pretty obvious trace, okay, which one defines in a very natural way. E, e, and that goes the same for when you have a common subalgebra and, and you take a so-called amalgamated free product over B. Uh, and by the way, you can do that just with taking MI to be trash of Neumann algebra, not necessarily two one factors. In general, though, whenever you take this operation, you do get a two one factor at the end, unless you know some, you know, uh, accidental, uh, uh, you know, cooked up uh, constructions which are pretty, you know, uh, which which may not may fail to give you a two one factor. But in I mean, in general, you get a two one factor as a result of this operation. And cross product, you can do everything we did here. You can do, instead of L infinity of x, you take an arbitrary threshold for Neumann algebra. Okay, so finite for Neumann algebra with a faithful normal trace state and, and with a, a, an action of a group that preserves that trace by automorphism. And then you do exactly the same construction here. Uh, uh, you know, on L2 of B, uh, tensor product with little L2 of gamma. But, you know, the, the, this type of, you know, with formal series with the coefficients now in B, you know, it's exactly like that that you get this general cross product. And then there is a, a, an important ultra product construction, which I'll get. Uh, to that, you know, a definition in a second. I, I'll not define it here, but it's the type of uh, construction that one uses often also in logic in many subjects, you know, the ultra product type construction. Here is with respect to the metric gi given by the, the NOR2 on the uh, components uh, and uh, NOR, the one that we, given by the trace, of course, on bounded sequences operator bounded sequences. Uh, and this is particularly interesting when you take, uh, I mean, when you take just one, the MN are all equal to the same M, this is something we'll denote by M omega, the ultra power of M, and for instance, the ultra power of, of R is an algebra that will come up again later. Uh, okay. So what I want to end with before the taking a pause uh, is to point out this theorem of uh, Marai von Neumann, um, which I give you as an exercise, very useful. 
So f first of all, I remind you that if you have, well, I remind you, so this is the first exercise, and it's trivial. So if I take an abelian for Neumann algebra, I forgot to say here what is A. So A is always, oh yes, I did, I'm sorry. So if A is an abelian for Neumann algebra with the diffuse uh, uh, state, oh, I'm sorry, a diffuse von Neumann algebra, by that I mean that it has no, no minimal uh, projections, so no atoms, okay, uh, with a, a normal state or completely additive and faithful, so it's like an integral, right, uh, okay, then this is isomorphic to L infinity of zero, one with the Lebesgue measure, uh, I mean the integral over the Lebesgue measure. Uh, why that? This is a very useful exercise and it's trivial, okay? So what you do is you construct an increasing sequence of uh, dyadic partitions. So I call them dyadic because they will have measure with respect to tau, two to the n, okay? So you, uh, you approximate any function Remember, it's countably generated, so it's sufficient to do it, you know, with for more and more elements in A. And you, you uh, approximate that by step functions, and the step functions, you can assume, obviously, that they have measure k over 2 to the n for some common n. Okay, and, yes, okay? and this is it. And then you just refine them more and more, and so you kind of recovered L infinity of zero one when you write zero one in a dyadic form, I mean, as dyadic numbers, okay? So, uh, so this is it for that. And now you have the, the non-commutative version of that. Uh, so first to state that, uh, let's give a definition. So we'll call a threshold for Neumann algebra approximately finite dimensional, AFD abbreviated, if for any finite subset of M and any epsilon, uh, one can find the finite dimensional subalgebra of M, uh, for Neumann subalgebra, such that the, any, ele, any, any uh, of the elements in F is approximated by elements in B. And of course, this is the shortest, the, the closest to x in the norm 2. So uh, that amounts to saying that x minus the expectation of, of, of uh, x on to b uh, is in norm 2 less than epsilon, okay? So you can approximate in norm 2 any finite set of elements arbitrarily well by finite dimensional Fonemann subalgebras. That's AFD. And so these are my non-commutative step functions, right, dyadic functions, but, uh, well, I'm not requiring them here to be of specific, uh, you know, to be n by matrix, I mean, 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix algebra, but obviously this you can do, and that's the essence of this theorem of Maren von Neumann. So if m is a d, then uh, and it's countably generated, which, by the way, is equivalent to requiring that it's norm to separable. Okay, it's very easy to prove this as another exercise. Then M is isomorphic to R. And how do you prove that is exactly right this exercise. Okay, just think a little bit about it, and it's really, you know, more or less the same, except that, of course, it will, it's not that easy to, it's ugly to write down in, you know, details of this, but it's absolutely clear intuitively, okay? So, remember, it's in non-2, so which makes things, you know, like, like in here, okay? Uh, it's approximation, in so-called so in measure, so that's why you can, uh, you know, change the, the measure of the, the, of the uh, step functions to be dyadic, k over 2 to the end. And it's uh, very easy here to, to, to you know, pass from arbitrary <coughs> finite dimensional to this type of finite dimensional approximation and to make it increasing. So this is what you have to do, right? To get your model for r. You remember how we constructed r as 2 to the end by 2 to the end. Okay, so uh, this is it. and. After, by the way, this is a very clear corollary, so we have a, you know, a nice corollary out of that, uh, that R, R 
to the T, the amplifications of R are obviously A of D by the definition of R. Okay, and by matrices, and it's clear, and also when you cut with projection, it's clear. Okay, think a bit about that. And from these two together, you know, you get that R to the T is A of D for any T, so therefore, R to the T is obviously to R for any T, so that means it's like saying that the fundamental group of R is R plus. Okay? So uh, after the break, uh, we'll introduce the notion of amenability and we'll prove uh, this. By the way, you should notice that uh, we have other examples of uh, AFD for Neumann algebras, not only R to the T. You see, for instance, if you take this group, which is locally finite, uh, this is L of S infinity, is a, a, obviously AFD. You take any group that's locally finite, meaning that it's a union of finite groups, that's ICC, uh, th this will give you, therefore, all of them will give you the two one factor. You can construct many of them, of course. Okay, and uh, also if you take any uh, free ergodic action of S infinity on the probability measure space, that all also is AFD. It's a trivial exercise, okay? So you have lots of oh, somewhat less obvious that, you know, this for Neumann algebra are isomorphic to R, okay, o already. And of course, I did not even mention, but, you know, this R, if you take infinite tensor product of 3 by 3 or any n k by k matrices, the same way we did with the, with, uh, the hyperfinite one taking k equals 2, you know, you can take any k larger than 2, and you know, you get, this will still be R, okay, by Marian von Neumann here. Okay, so let's take a, a, a short break, maybe until the 10 minutes past, and then uh, we'll go on with the, so the next thing we'll do this is this, um, that we introduce the notion of amenability for von Neumann algebras. I remind you what is the amenability for groups. The reason I will do it for groups is because I'll even give a proof for groups because that will be the template for proving similar results for, for the von Neumann algebras, okay? The scope will be in the second part to uh, prove Cohn's theorem that all amenable to one factors are uh, isomorphic to R. So. Okay, so uh, I wanted to remind you uh, first the definition of uh, an amenable group. A uh, group is amenable if it has what's called an invariant mean, that means a state on uh, little n infinity of, of gamma, so the bounded, the bounded uh, 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 functions on, on gamma uh, uh, with various scalar values, functions, uh, so scalar values. Okay, such that they, uh, so on, on L infinity you have the action of gamma by left translation, so F goes to uh, F sub G like this on the left because I'm translating from the left in this way. Okay, so phi, phi cannot <coughs> distinguish such translations, so phi of the translation of F by G is equal to phi of F or any F in L infinity. <coughs> okay, so this is like a, phi is like a hard measure. If, if gamma would be finite, okay, stupidly, because our groups here, we view them, it's, they are discrete groups. Say if, if we would have a compact group that is like, you know, this would be uh, the you know, L, L infinity, the, script, the capital L. The, with respect to the hard measure, then, you know, that's what uh, this, uh, the hard measure will have that property. Uh, so, uh, phi, um, because of just being a state, it's additive <coughs> on, on subsets of, of gamma, but not completely additive, 
okay? And uh, so that's the difference with respect to the hard measure. So that's what's called an invariant mean. And uh, now a threshold from <coughs> an algebra, so there is an analog of invariant mean, and here it is. The terminology was coined by, by Korn, and that's a property that he proposed. Uh, okay? Uh, so a threshold for Neumann algebra, we say it's amenable if it has a hypertrace uh, or uh, invariant mean. That is a state on B of L2 of M uh, that has uh, the algebra M as usual. The M is viewed here as lambda of M, so the level multiplication by M. Okay? Uh, so has m in its centralizer, meaning that phi of xt is phi of tx for any x in m and t in b of h. Okay, we also want this kind of technical condition that phi restricted to m is the trace tau, that uh, condition that's of course redundant if you have, if, if uh, m is a, is a factor, because there you have a unique trace, and of course phi Having this property has it for t equals y in m, so it is a trace when it's restricted to m. But here we, we even require that it's equal to the initial trace tau, which will be automatic for factor. And one has this observation that it's L of gamma is amenable as a threshold for Neumann algebra, if and only if gamma is amenable. And the proof is very easy. It's a proof I learned from. Uh, I mean, I don't know actually historically who did this first observation, but in any case, uh, Kohn for sure proved this in, in one of his papers. Uh, but I'm not sure that, he, you know, it was him who noticed this. So uh, here is the proof. is If you take a state in B of L2 and with L of gamma in its centralizer, uh, then uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, diagonal of B of H, L infinity of gamma acting on L2 as diagonal operators, like we did, you know, if you remember in our first example. Okay, so this is... Okay, uh, then uh, phi restricted to the, this diagonal is a state uh, on D, therefore on L infinity, which satisfies because of... Um, uh, be because of the hypertrace property satisfies this, right? But UG F UG star is just the translation by uh, F with G from the left, something that I leave you as an exercise. So this restriction is an invariant mean. Okay. If you have a hypertrace, you have an invariant mean on gamma. This is completely, it's very pretty, but really trivial, very easy, I mean. Now, conversely, if uh, gamma is amenable and I have a state uh, uh, on L infinity that's in an invariant mean, uh, so then I can take sort of integral like you would take, you know, if this you interpret phi as a, as a, as a hard measure, okay, on, on gamma on the, on the ground space. Okay, this has a pretty obvious meaning, you know, it's just averaging and taking Banach limits. I leave you, you know, make a sense of this. It's really like, you know, you, you do that with respect to the hard measure. So uh, if you do that, then uh, this uh, functional, okay, which, so you average, you do, see what I'm doing. I'm taking the trace and I average it over the unitaries UG which are in L of gamma, and you remember they generate, these are the so-called canonical unitaries. Mm -hmm. So this will give you a state on B, okay? It's a weak limit of, of states on B. Uh, ah, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to say something which was crucial here, and that is, it's not tau, it's an extension of tau to B. Uh, because, ah, I don't have the take file, <laughs> cannot, change it on the spot. So instead of tau, please put um, uh, twiddle uh, tau, okay? Uh, so it's it's an extension of, so first I'm taking the trace 
now of, on, uh, on, uh, on M, and I extend it to a state on, uh, on B of, of H, on B of L2, okay? And that is the thing I'm averaging, okay? Sorry about that. So this will be a state on B, uh, which will have UH, obviously, because of the kind of hard measure properties, you know, averaging with this, you know, will be insensible to with taking out of UH. So this will be a centralized, in the centralizer of this state on B of H. And also, obviously, because of the construction, this tau, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this uh, psi restricted to M, so each time I take this little t, ug, uh, and then add ug, compose with add ug, this will have, uh, will, will be equal to the trace on, on L of gamma. So weak limit will still be equal to, to trace because it's pointwise. So, so it's equal to the trace and it has you, the, the canonical unitar is in the centralizer. Okay, let's prove that this implies that, that it has all of L of gamma in the centralizer. It, it's not immediate, right? Because, you know, you have, a, you, have, you, you, have um, you know, L of gamma is, is uh, the SO closure of the, you know, the span of, the, of this unitary. So how do you go to the limit of, with such things? So I'm using Kaplansky, so for any X in L of gamma, and epsilon, I take x0 in the complex algebra, which we know is I, the group algebra, which we know is in the centralizer, so an x0 there, with norm less than 1 also, okay? Which approximates to epsilon in norm 2x. And now I'm implying Cauchy-Schwarz, and you have this, that, by Cauchy-Schwarz, that psi of uh, x minus x0 times t, is less than, uh, so it's, it's less than phi of x0 minus x0 times x0 minus x0. Let's do it for one of them. What did I do? Let's do it for one of them. Okay. So I'll do it for uh, the second one because it's, oops. Sorry. Okay. So psi of p x minus x zero. Okay. This by Cauchy Schwartz is equal to uh, psi of p p star one over two psi of x minus x zero star x minus x zero one over two. But this, so psi restricted to L of gamma is the trace. So this is trace. This is norm 2 of x minus x0. Okay? And this is bounded by 1. So together it's epsilon. And the same with the other, except that you get x0 minus x0 times x0 minus x0 star. But psi is a trace. Okay, so it doesn't matter on which side you, you take the star. So you get, and since it was, you have that these are equal, you get the, you know, the other is equal because of the arbitrary of x. So now, uh, if M is a threshold for Neumann algebra, then I should point out that it's equivalent to having that M is amenable, so you have this hypertrace in it, the representation of M on L2 with the fact that you have it for any representation of, of uh, I mean, normal representation of M as a von Neumann algebra. Uh, and that there exists some normal representation, another one than L2 of M. So I'm not stuck with the you know, representation on L2 of M with the, this hypertrace thing. Uh, there is, of course, underlying this, uh, there is another property, but I didn't want to get into that, which is the so-called injectivity property for uh, describing all this, which, uh, but which is quite trivially equivalent with the existence of hypertrace, the injectivity property. So this 
existence of hypertrace or invariant mean is what we call amenability for the Fonemann algebra for the dual factor. The other property, uh, injectivity, requires the existence of a, of a conditional expectation from B of H onto M, uh, and uh, which, however, has the advantage of, you know, you, you can. Uh, it's a property that makes sense for any von Neumann algebra, and you know that's what you call a von Neumann algebra being injective. And you have, uh, in the case of partial von Neumann algebras, the equivalence of these two properties, okay? Of in any case of factors. So the corollary to uh, what the discussion and the proofs here give you this corollary. So first of all, uh, uh, M is amenable and B is in M upon M as subalgebra, then B is amenable, okay, because of this, for instance, right? Because you have this, uh, you know, existence of a hypertrace on B in B of L2 of M, of course. Just the restriction of the hypertrace on M is a hypertrace on B. So you get that this is amenable. And also, uh, this, this is a corollary to this uh, proof here. Okay, it's very easy. This proof, okay, immediately you can adapt it to also deduce this, that uh, if you have a von Neumann algebra, which is generated, uh, I mean a threshold von Neumann, which is generated by an amenable subalgebra uh, with a group of unitaries in M that normalize B uh, in this sense and with gamma amenable, okay, then the, okay, so and M is generated by B and this unitar is normalizing B, okay, then M is amenable, okay. In particular, whenever you have an amenable group acting on the probability measure space, the, this construction, the group measure space construction, give you an amenable von Neumann algebra if the group is amenable, okay? But, you know, many more than that. So it's, this is really, uh, you know, the, the proof here, I mean, you easily, you know, implies this. So it's a corollary to these considerations. So uh, now amenable groups have this so-called Ferner characterization, uh, and uh, sorry for the misspell here. So Ferner's uh, characterization of am amenability. The, by the way, the amenability was introduced by uh, um, by uh, von Neumann. Um, I forgot in what was the uh, year. Uh, but it's this property is very important that Ferner uh, came up with, the so-called Ferner property for group, for uh, uh, characteristics, uh, Ferner's property for amenable groups. So if gamma is amenable, uh, says this uh, result, if and only if it satisfies the following condition for any finite uh, subset of gamma and epsilon, there exists a finite set, or non empty here, uh, such that if you take the, if you multiply k by any element in, in f, you, you translate it, uh, the intersection with k is big. So if you take the, the thing that goes out, that's, you know, small, epsilon small respect to, to, with respect to the size of k, okay? So with that, uh, that's the intuition. So you have a set that, you know, when you, this is k, and when you uh, displace it by g, this is gk, with g in f. And all of those are small, even, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is the proof. So first of all, if you take uh, uh, such a set, so let's prove the, this, the right to the left. If you have the property where you have the, I mean, uh, where you have the invariant mean, that's clear. Uh, because you take, uh, you know, some ki that are more, and more, more and more invariant to finite sets that exhaust gamma, and you take this Banach limit uh, of averaging over, I mean, averaging over that set ki, okay? Uh, so, and you, you do this as an exercise, it's very easy to prove that this is an invariant mean. I mean, it, it's insensible to 
translations be. And uh, now, it's the other proof, the other, I'm sorry, implication that that's the reason I stated this theorem. I wanted to do the proof. Uh, it's a, a, a proof that was la later found, uh, not uh, the original Fellner's proof. So first it's a, so the first observation is that from this uh, state that's invariant, and which, by the way, is additive, but not completely additive, necessarily. Actually, it's never completely additive unless the group is finite. Okay? You cannot have such uh, invariant measures. You do. That's another exercise. Okay? So from that, you can get arbitrarily uh, uh, inv almost invariant, uh, uh, so really completely additive functionals, but which are unfortunately only approximately invariant. So in this sense, so for given any finite set f and any epsilon, there exists a psi in L1 of gamma, which is in the predual of little l infinity. So it's like you view this as state. So by one here, actually, I really mean of norm one, not norm less than one. So psi, OK? Uh, norm of size 1, so the, the sum of the entries is equal to 1. It's positive functions on gamma. That's our L1 summable. Sum is 1. Uh, okay, such that psi minus the translation of psi part by gamma, by G, I'm sorry, uh, is in norm 1 is less than uh, epsilon. And this is just a thing, I mean, it does, you know, since epsilon and f are arbitrary, I can put or not this f, but I will put it because, you know, of my calculations for any g in, in f. So how you do, do that? It's it's Han Banach. So you take uh, L1 of gamma to the power f uh, and to contain, uh, to consider this Banach space and take this uh, convex subspace of all such uh, f tuples, <laughs> so to say, of uh, psi minus psi sub g. Uh, with psi, uh, you know, so such uh, L1, again, you know, this means that the norm of size 1, so the sum of the entries of psi is equal to 1, psi is positive, uh, and uh, it's sufficient to show that 0 is in the norm closure of C, right? That's what we need to prove, okay? And um, indeed it is because, uh, I mean, that right away. So it is indeed because if it wouldn't be, then there would exist an f. I uh, this is used f upper g means an f indexed by g f depending on g f of g if you want in an infinity such that you have this separation right from zero. Okay. So that's of course because of the fact that this the the dual of this. Banach space is L infinity to the power F. So these are the, the F entries of that F tuple in L infinity that separates, you know, by Han Banach. Okay? Uh, but if you take this and you have this for all size, you take weak limits and it's still valid, okay? And, and your, your invariant mean, uh, how did we call it the invariant mean, whatever, phi? So you, that you, you will get this, that it, this is true also for phi, and that gives you 0 rather than c, because for phi, this is 0, right? It's invariant, too, so you get a contradiction. So this is very pretty, and you, it, it's to, I always like this very much, and it's, it's deep. I mean, as a, I mean, it has been used, this kind of reasoning, in many situations where you, you know, you bring something that's sort of transcendental object like, you know, this kind of singular state that's an invariant mean, okay, which is not in L1, it's in the dual of L infinity, but not in L1, it's additive, but not completely additive. That's why I'm saying that it's sort of a transcendental object, and you bring it down to Earth, okay, that by that I mean in L1, in L1 uh, 
satisfying approximately the property, okay? And uh, then from that almost invariant B in, in little l1, okay, so I, I can, because of, you know, taking this thing here less than epsilon over F, I can assume that you have this sum over G. That makes it more easy to do the argument down. So I have this situation now that you have an L1, which is almost invariant to this finite set in this sense. Then I want to prove that there exists a, a T, a level set, I mean, su such that you, if, if you cut off B at the T level, okay, uh, then uh, you have for that level set the estimate. But of course, here you have to have, you know, relative to the, the size of this level set. Okay? And by the way, these level sets are finite sets. Okay? I mean, it's a spectral projection, so it's a characteristic function of, uh, of a set, but that set is finite. Okay? Because you cut a line at a positive level. Okay. So how do you do that? It's kind of clear. I mean, you know, you, you write, uh, it's a Pubini trick, uh, I mean, the first observation is that if you have uh, positive numbers, you know, you, you, you write uh, the difference is this integral. And uh, so if you will have uh, functions now which are positive valued, say B1 and B2, in L1, then uh, the level, I mean, this ET, uh, you know, it's the, the the level, the I'm sorry, the, the cutoff of V1 at T. Uh, so this I'm I'm writing it as functions, but it's really at at any point, uh, you know, in G. I mean, uh, in the group gamma. So point wise, you have this. Okay. So that to, I'm applying this to E T of B B1 and E T of B2 at the. So my y1 and y2 are the, the application of these functions at the point G. So the, you have this point wise, and hence you have also in this in R2 that you just integrate over L1. I mean, uh, you know, uh, summing up in L1 of gamma, right? So you will have that, and applying this to B1 is the B. B, one of that B1 and B2 being B and the other one translation of, of B by G, you have this, <coughs> okay? So there must exist a T such that the level set satisfy that, or else, you know, you would not have this strict inequality here. If you assume that you have larger than or equal for all T, then you integrate and you get, you know, the a contradiction. If you have this for all, I'm sorry, here you have larger than for all. So this, by the way, strict inequality also implies that E is, is not zero. Okay? So you have a sub, an actual set. Okay? So this is it. This is the proof. Um, well, E is just the character. I mean, K is the support of E. Okay, so let's, let's uh, prove from this, this uh, theorem uh, con, con, cons, so I, I'll prove that uh, this uh, Fulner type condition four to one factors, uh, which states that if M is a two one factor in its representation on L2 by left multiplication and M is uh, amenable, then for any uh, finite set F of unitaries and any epsilon, there exists a finite rank projection in, in L2 uh, M on L2 M such that you have this inequality in the Hilbert Schmidt norm given by the trace on B of H. Okay? So this will be the further condition we are uh, aiming at. Uh, it's uh, the, it's a, this theorem is due to Korn and it's uh, important because um, 
this, this Fellner type conditions are, you know, in, in this uh, uh, operator algebra context are uh, very important. It's, it's really, this is very, you know, it's the crucial uh, thing uh, for uh, the theorem that we'll prove next. So uh, let's do that. I want to emphasize that it's exactly the same proof. So first step is exactly the same, OK? I mean, it's really, literally, exactly the same. So I won't do it because, you know. Now, the thing here, and this is a subtility, uh, so we get this almost invariant uh, L1 functions, but it's in L1 of B, so these are trace class, okay, uh, operators on B. That will be the analog of my little L1 of the group gamma, is the L1 of B with the, with the trace. So it's, you know, here, here it's, we are talking about these two space, I mean, two, the, but which are kind of well known to us, right? We know them quite well. It's basic uh, stuff in functional analysis. So it's L2 of B of L2 M, something I abbreviated with just B, and the trace. This is B of H with the trace. So these are the Hilbert Schmidt operator. OK, that's what we call, and respectively, L1 of B and the trace. OK, these are the trace class operators. <coughs> On H. OK. And it's uh, so it's given by this norm. Trace of the absolute value of x. These are compact operators with, you know, summable in this case and square summable here, summable, uh, you know, the diagonal of the absolute value, and <coughs> so uh, I we need to switch to the norm two estimate from this norm, one estimate, this is kind of crucial because you cannot do from this, you cannot obtain this finite, this is really norm two, this estimate, and you, that we, one gets and one can get. So how you switch to norm two from this is uh, via the powers, so-called power term inequality, which says that in, uh, for uh, elements in L1 of any semi-finite von Neumann algebra with a trace, and in particular in B of H, you have this estimate. So B1 and B2 are in L1. Their square root would therefore be in L2. So the square root of B1 minus the square root of B2, these are positive operators. In R2, 2 to the square is less than the B1, the norm 1 of B1 minus B2, the trace class norm. Okay, and that's also majorized by the norm 2. This is, this inequality is more trivial, more easy. This is the so-called power server. Okay, and it's su somewhat subtle. It's a very important inequality by power server in um, the uh, 75, I guess, was a paper. So uh, with this norm 2, so we have what? That implies that uh, if, uh, OK, so OK, let's see. Yeah, I did not. Uh, well, um, yeah, so the thing is, which I have, yes, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I kind of lost the line here. So uh, this is the argument, the power term inequality, but what this gives is 
uh, of course, uh, again, we applied to, you know, B1 is equal to, to um, uh, so to, to the initial the B and B2 to the, right, to the UB star. Um, and this will tell you, using this, that you have for the square root of this B that's almost invariant in norm 1, the square root of B satisfies this norm 2 inequality, okay? There is a, a little sacrifice, I think, because of this term. Okay, so we are we passed. So we have an element. It's b square root of b, the initial b, which in norm two, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm, is uh, small. Okay, it's, this is almost invariant in the norm two. Uh, uh, with with the right side, so the the norm two of b to the square root of b being one. Okay, because uh, this element b here had trace equals to 1. Okay? Like in the proof of the uh, group case. So there is a, a trick here which in norm 2 allows you to, from this inequality, okay, the invariance of uh, an element. So my a here is the square root of b. This is what we had from previous page. And from that, I want to prove that, to argue that there is a, a level set, a spectral projection of A for which we have this, okay? With exactly that type of Namioka trick, okay? The integral, etc. you have to have a T. And that's by using this uh, smart uh, so-called joint, uh, cons joint distribution trick. And I want to kind of uh, skip that and uh, yeah, so uh, it's one constructs a, a sort of virtual measure that imi imitates what's happening with this the distribution of functions of of uh, if you it's general, right? If you have two operators which are positive in L two finite rank, I make it because of obviously you can assume everything here is finite rank. Um, then you know the, there is a, a measure on uh, on r times r, which on on functions you know on the x coordinate and y coordinate imitate ex exactly what's happening with one and the other. So because of that, it's like uh, you can actually assume that the two uh, operators that you want to for which you want to apply this kind of Namioka type trick, they commute. And uh, it's very uh, slick argument, very very nice argument of Korn, um, which uh, allows you, you know, to carry on and and uh, you know really again use this kind of Kubini trick, and you must have some t for which you have the proper inequality. Okay, so we'll have that on the web anyway. It's actually sufficient details that you can complete the argument. Okay, so let's prove now from this this uh, theorem of Korn from 1976, which is uh, a pretty remarkable theorem. It's really, you know, I, I used to I call it always fundamental theorem, uh, and it says that any separable, amenable, or if you prefer here, you can say countably. Generated amenable to one factor is AFD and that's isomorphic to R. So, in other words, R is the unique amenable to one factor separate. Okay, so uh, we first prove so we but already have the the Fulmer condition, Korn's Fulmer condition. Okay, so from that, I want to prove that. You can find, you can uh, approximate any set of elements sort of locally in the following sense. So, given any set f of unitaries finite and any epsilon, uh, okay, uh, yeah, it's, I did not actually state it. Uh, okay, so <laughs> let's carry it on. So, what I, I'll tell you what, I'll make a picture of what I want to prove. I'll come to that at some point, but so this is your one factor, amenable to one factor, and I have my set, finite set here. What I want to prove is that I have 
not a, a, a finite dimensional algebra B yet, okay? Uh, so uh, finite dimensional subalgebra means that it has the same unit, okay, as M. But instead of that, I have a little piece, okay, uh, typically infinitesimal, so under some projection S, uh, my set uh, F, okay, uh, uh, okay, my, my elements actually, I take them unitary elements, so uh, I can find a, a, a tiny projection S with a, a finite dimensional algebra here such that this U is, looks like this some stuff here, and here x belongs almost to this subalgebra B0 that's finite dimensional. That's local AFD, okay? Local because th this are like, so after cutting off with S, S commutes basically with U. Actually, it's everything will be approximate. Uh, after cutting with U, uh, it belongs to B0, and this will also be approximate. So this is local AFD. Well, how do you do that? Uh, well, intuitively, at least, it's very easy. So by, by Korn's Fellner condition, we have that projection. Actually, I think we denoted it E, but, well, let's call it P here. It's a projection on some uh, finite dimensional subspace of L to M. Uh, okay of course, because it's finite rank, uh, such that you have this. Of course, by density of M and Gram-Schmidt kind of thing, you may assume H0 is really in M, in M hat, right? Which is a subspace in L to M. So I'm taking some orthonormal basis of H0, okay? Uh, and um, the, I will use this lemma which is like a black box. So this is a continuation of the proof. I'm inserting here this technical thing which I'll be using and which says that given any finite subset of M uh, and delta, there exists a tiny infinitesimal projection in M such that squeezing by, by uh, Q, by this projection, any element in F prime, you get the, the, the trace of, of X. Uh, the size of your approximation is relative to the size of Q, okay? But because of that, you can even do this in, in uniform norm and therefore be able to renounce to this, uh, you know, Q, same Q on the other side. So it's really, you know, after cutting, so if you just take that window, infinitesimal window, Q, the Q window, X looks like a scalar on that piece, and actually the trace color, okay? So uh, how do you next proceed is you apply that to this F prime. This, these are your, the orthonormal basis here, uh, and uh, U is in the middle. Let me explain what's, what I'm doing. Actually, we'll do that, we, I write it down. I'm taking, H0 Q H0 star. This, uh, if you want the span of this. So this is this eta i Q uh, eta j star. These elements, okay? And I'm taking the span of them. So if you want the sum over scalar multiple, sum over i and j. And please notice that because of my, if I denote by e, e i j, these elements, because of you know this property, for instance, uh, the, you know this uh, this uh, see I, I have the Q eta j star uh, eta k Q is delta j k basically, right? I mean really well times Q of course. Uh, relative to the size, but even in uniform norm, I can do that. You see, it's, this delta is independent of any epsilon or number of elements in it. So it's, you can do this so 
tiny bit that you know no computer in the world will distinguish. So you really can assume that this is equal, okay, for the purposes we are doing. So this is like a matrix unit. It satisfies this. Okay, they so this will be my B0, this algebra that approximates, you know, that algebra. So this will be B0. And the fact that I have that squeezed up by squeezed by by um, by uh, I mean squeezing by Q even with the U in the middle tells me that that if I take the support 1B0 is equal to S if I take uh, S U S okay that's uh, basically contained in this V0 this is what this says okay again you know because I can do this so I mean this is of course again an approximation but it's really like belonging because delta is you know enormously small with all the other things being so on a tiny tiny window basically you know SUS is in B0 okay so I uh, w with that there is just one thing where I have a, some sacri so here is for sure S U S will belong to this B0 the only thing where my epsilon spoils the thing, the initial epsilon, so this is because of delta, is these zeros. Here, these, are, these zeros are epsi within epsilon. Okay? So let's put together all this. This is what I was trying to explain in this. You see, it's all that. So what I'm saying is this is where I have that. So actually, this is all I will need, but uh, uh, yes. So the this is S U S U uh, S U star. So the 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 commutator between U and S, okay, uh, or U S U star minus S or U S minus S U star S U. Uh, in norm 2 is less than epsilon s, so this is this epsilon, but it's relative to the size of s, okay? s is this, uh, what I denoted by uh, the, the identity of B0, of this algebra, okay? Ah, I forgot to here write it down, thank you. Uh, okay, now this here, though, okay, this is delta, okay? So this is what, where I was saying that basically SUS is equal to this. I mean, this is like zero, right? Okay. However, I only use that, okay? But I just wanted to emphasize this aspect, okay? So we have, uh, we have proved this, okay, uh, that for any F in M finite, I'm not taking it anymore to be a unitary because, you know, using the fact that any element is a combination of four unitaries, you, you really prove this, that any f in m finite, any epsilon, there exists a b0 in m, non-zero finite dimensional star algebra such that if you denote by s its support, then this support almost commutes with all y's uh, in the set f, and when you, when you compress by S, that belongs to B0 modular epsilon relative to the size of S, okay? So you have this picture, okay? You have this picture. Now, from that local approximation, you get a global approximation by finite dimensionals through a maximality argument. And this is pretty easy and straightforward, except there is a subtility. And that's that you use, um, you see, I'm taking this, the, the family for which, you know, inductive, the or, I'm sorry, the, yes, inductively ordered uh, family F is this, is the family of all, or rather, the set of all families of subalgebras BI of M with 
which are finite dimensional, have mutually orthogonal supports, so the things that will look like this. Okay, finite dimensional, okay. Of, of course, being with this condition, you already have that they are at most countable. A and uh, with the property that you, you have this commutation when you sum up, I mean, when you take its unit, okay, and with this approximation. Uh, now, this is obviously in inductively ordered. I mean, <coughs> where the place where you may get suspicious how you get that to work is because you may not see that everything adds up very nicely because of Pythagoras' theorem. Okay? So when, once you, you take a maximal element and you want to prove that that maximal element has identity equal to 1m, which is the global approximation, uh, okay, if don't, if not, okay, then doing here what we've done, you know, with the local approximation adds up properly to the whole thing because of Pythagoras. Everything is mutually orthogonal, okay? So it adds up splendidly because of this, uh, you know, relative thing. You have on the right side this thing. So, of course, you will work with the squares of this relations and everything works with Pythagoras, okay? So, let me just make some comments. So the, the proof of, uh, of con or this implication uh, is actually different from this. This is, was a proof that I gave, in fact, in, um, in the 80s. And um, the original proof, though, of con you know, was very important. I mean, uh, uh, right. In my opinion, this proof is the right proof in the Tuan case. But his proof had an amazing, you know, depth. Uh, it inspired uh, the sister algebra people who were trying, you know, to follow the same kind of, you know, to prove similar result that you have this, um, you know, uh, structural uh, theorem for amenable sister algebras, or so-called nuclear sister algebras. Uh, and and uh, so uh, it, it was a, a, a major uh, source of inspiration, okay, for, for all that, uh, uh, you know, field, for all that area in time, especially lately with the work of uh, T. Quisis, White, and Winter, that, that breakthrough, you know, which, uh, I won't comment more on, on that. So uh, now, in his proof, Kohn um, shows, goes through <coughs> this, uh, so it's, it shows that uh, if M is amenable, so just uh, by amenability, uh, condition implies that you can embed M into R omega, okay, and, and that it splits off the, the hyperfinite to one. And from that, is, this is actually what, you know, these people have built on. Uh, and Korn also on that occasion, you know, uh, uh, says that, well, it, sh it should be true that any two one factor, separable two one factor, should be embeddable into R omega, and that's, you know, the famous Korn's approximate embedding conjecture, uh, which I have stated here for what that means for groups. Uh, it's a very beautiful problem. And there is this alternative characterization of uh, Kenley Jung from 2007 of uh, amenability. Uh, there are many uh, by now, you know, abstract characterizations of R. I mean, not that many, in fact, but there are, you know, if and only if for R that are, you know, uh, se several of them. Uh, I would say, you know, these are the ones that I, I would say are more pretty than others. So. Uh, the, so uh, <coughs> M is uh, the only uh, the amenable to one factor is the only subfactor of R omega that is uh, with the property that any two embeddings of it in R omega are um, unitary conjugate, and um, there is here this open problem. So let me see what I have missed today of what I wanted to do. Ah, yes. 
So this is a pity, but we'll start with that next time. So I wanted along, because it's really identical proof, to also prove, show you this. Uh, let me at least state this theorem. So I promised you to say what the uh, Cartan's algebra is in general. So here is you know the bit of a history and the actual definition. So if M is a two-one factor in and B is, B is a phonemal subalgebra, then uh, I denote like that its normalizer in M. Okay, the set of unitaries that you know add U leaves B invariant. Obviously, it's a group of unitaries in M. Uh, and you call uh, B regular in M if this uh, group uh, generates uh, uh, M as a phonemal algebra, okay? So, of course, uh, unitaries in B normalize, the normalize B, and if you only have those, then you call it a singular uh, subalgebra. These are the terminologies, and the whole, you know, thing was introduced by Dixby in, in mid-50s. Uh, uh, and um, when A is a regular massa, that's how he called it, so uh, uh, ma maximal abelian subalgebra that's regular, that has been called a Cartan subalgebra starting with the 70s. So the terminology was coined by Bershik and, and it was popularized by Feldman and Moore. Uh, okay? So that's what the Cartan subalgebra is in general. Uh, and now, uh, you remember that basic construction. Well, I want to make this observation. If B is regular in M, and you take the basic construction algebra, so this is semi-finite. You remember it's the algebra generated by, for M and algebra generated by M and EB, uh, with its trace, canonical trace. Uh, then this is semi-finite in on this algebra. By that I mean, so this is, the trace is defined here. On B prime, uh, well, this is a smaller algebra, by the way, uh, you know, it may be, uh, as it happens, it's not. I mean, this uh, algebra contains, for instance, EB. You remember, EB commutes with, with B. And trace is finite on, on EB. That you remember also, trace of, trace, satisfy this property. In particular, the trace of EB is 1. Okay? So, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, you have some one element on which the trace is finite, but requiring that it's semi-finite here means that you have a a whole increasing sequence of projections on which the trace is finite. And that happens whenever, uh, if B is regular in M, then you do have that the trace here is semi-finite. So you have lots of projections on which it's finite, filling up the identity. Okay, that's important for what we, the proof of this fact, so which is this theorem of Kohn-Feldman Weiss, which generalizes also theorem of Einstein Weiss just a year before them. This is in 81. Einstein Weiss is in 1980. And Einstein Weiss is the second part of the theorem. So if Kohn-Feldman Weiss says that if M is separable amenable to one factor with the Cartan subalgebra, then this inclusion is isomorphic to the the, the diagonal, you remember, D is the diagonal of R, as we defined it in the, the beginning of first lecture, of this Cartan subalgebra. So it's isomorphic to this model Cartan subalgebra, okay? This isomorphism means an isomorphism of M onto R that carries A onto D. So in particular, as I will explain, uh, Tomorrow, the, any two free ergodic PMP actions of any two countable amenable groups are orbit equivalent. We'll see that this, which is Einstein Weiss from 1980s, a year before Kohn-Feldman Weiss, uh, you know, follows from from this. Okay, so the proof I wanted to do it all in one sense. So I couldn't finish. Today, I wanted to do it all in one because it's really basically identical. I mean, it's just, you know, the same proof. So you, you get, you know, the Fellner type condition, 
uh, I'm using this algebra here. Here is where we'll do the this trick with the you know the Ferner the the Ferner type condition will be there. So you get and and from that with this kind of local quantization and you know this trick of taking this algebra from us. I call it local quantization because you get a, an almost invariant space, this is a vector space, but hitting it with Q uh, like, like that and, and doing this makes it into an algebra. So it's really, to me, you know, it's very visual. It's like, you know, sort of low quantization of, of a vector space of sorts, right? And so it's, uh, you know, really exactly otherwise the same. Actually, you know what? I'll consider this is done. Uh, so, and then, you know, uh, I'll start from here, actually. Uh, from uh, here. So, this so-called important remark, okay? From uh, tomorrow. Sorry about it. Thank you.